Well, thank you all for, uh, for your time and attention. I'm originally from uh, the brutal prairies of eastern North Dakota, and I, I moved to Fairbanks uh, for the nicer winters um, a, a number of years ago. When I was a kid, it was kind of a routine. Um, spent a lot of time in the summers out at the, the old family farmstead, as shown here. And on Sunday, go to church, the Lutheran church, this is North Dakota, you know, out there in the prairies, and just like a Garrison Keillor story almost. We would come back to the grandparents' house after church, and the kids go out, play in the dirt, you know, run around because the oldsters, like parents and grandparents and aunts and uncles, would be in the house, sitting around the table, drinking coffee, and they would talk. And when you're a kid, when you're seven years old, the capacity, building capacity, the capacity of adults to talk is functionally inexhaustible. <laughs> and I was curious, though, about the, what, what could be so interesting and awesome that everyone's always spending all this time talking about stuff and not you know, playing in the dirt. And so I would kind of look her, you know, I, I, I'm hiding, but eavesdropping, what are they talking about? And the specific topics I didn't understand, I'm seven, you know, Vietnam, what? And you know, I didn't, didn't understand, but you would hear a couple of themes. One of the themes was, often, whatever the, the conversation was, someone would wrap it up and say, well, isn't it amazing what they can do these days? <laughs> That was usually in the context of so-and-so just got a new hip or, or some, you know, some medical miracle or some new piece of farm machinery that can do the work of two people with one person now. It not that amazing? Of course, sometimes they'd have a conversation and the wrap-up would be, well, it's just not the same anymore. <laughs> and even as a little kid, I realized that there was a common element here is that things do change over time. And that sometimes, apparently, the glass is half full. Isn't it amazing what they can do these days? And sometimes the glass is half empty. It's just not like it used to be. And if you think back to when I was a little kid, looking at grandparents and stuff, think of all that they had been through in the course of their lives. Even my, my mom tells the story when she was a little girl. She remembers the day they got a telephone. It was one of these, you know, those things. It was the first telephone. My dad remembers electricity coming to his farm when he was a little kid. My grandparents, they, when they were young, horses were a source of power and, and, and motion. And by the time before they died, they saw this. Think about the changes that they experienced in their own lifetime. This is from the Apollo 11 mission, 1969. That's Buzz Aldrin there. What, what changes that they must have seen? Things do change over time. And sometimes it's tough to know where you're going, I guess, over time, which leads us to uh, perhaps apocryphal saying, but allegedly Niels Bohr, the physicist, did say that prediction is difficult, um, particularly about the future. And just to illustrate this point, consider the following thought experiment. Let's say uh, your cell phone, despite being silenced before coming into a theater, let's say it rings. And you pick up the, the cell phone, you go, hello? And the person on the other side, just out of the blue, they say, I'd like you to make a prediction for me. I'm driving in my truck. Predict where I will be in one hour. Okay, now the ball's in your court. How do you, how do you answer this? And if I were put in that spot, I would say, well, uh, I would love to help you out. Could you pro provide some more information um, to help me, to help you? Like, where is this truck of yours that you're in? What direction is it pointed? How heavy is your foot? And the person might come back and say, oh, well, I'm in Delta Junction, and I'm heading toward Fairbanks. I'm going about 100 miles an hour. <laughs> so now we know a few things. So you can say, aha, we know enough now about the current state of things. We're going to predict the future. So you can reply, well, if the troopers don't catch you, in about an hour, you'll be in Fairbanks. So the, the lesson here is you've got to know what's going on now before you can predict the future. Bonus points if not only knowing what is going on, but why it's happening. That's also helpful. Well, what if you're in the weather business? The weather business can be stressful. Um, note the loss of hair over, <laughs> over 20 years. This is back in the old days. Look at those computer monitors, too. Those big, old, this is the mid-90s. Those big boat anchors, space heaters there. You can save money on heating your buildings because you have computer monitors back there. In the weather business, in Alaska especially, how do you know what's going on now? Uh, you Well, let's look at the weather radar. But in Alaska, we do have a couple of radars, but the network isn't as dense as in the lower 48, so sometimes storms literally sneak under the radar. We don't see them. Uh, weather balloons. Weather balloons are real. They're not just about conspiracies on the Art Bell Show. They, they do exist, and they're important. But 
What if a weather system is coming out of Alaska from the Arctic Ocean, it's gonna slam into the North Slope, or out of the Bering Sea or the Northeast Pacific? There's no weather balloons out there. We're missing a lot of data over the areas where the weather's important. Uh, often it's said, Alaska's different, which is maybe a polite way of saying, you got problems, kid, <laughs> that, that there's challenges. But, you know, the not available Hawaii, Alaska, Puerto Rico, but anywhere else, used to that. Alaska does have one advantage, though, in the, the weather observation business, and that is because we're on top of the planet, polar orbiting weather satellites, guess what? They go over the pole a lot. And who's next to the pole? It's us. So we get more coverage here from those satellites than even important places like Washington, D.C. or Los Angeles and such, nothing against them. But that's our one advantage. So we get um, imagery that looks kind of like this. This is Alaska about, uh, well, it's visible imagery, what you would see with the human eye if you were riding on the weather satellite. And you look down on Alaska there, so we have Anchorage there, Fairbanks, the North Slope, Bering Strait, and such. You can see the clouds and some of the landscape there. It's spatially comprehensive. We've got some view of, of what we're doing here. It tells us where the weather systems are and such. The theme of today's TED session is building capacity. Alaska's been a state since 19... 59. On the day Alaska became a state, the number of weather satellites orbiting the Earth was zero. There was nothing. Uh, Sputnik had just gone up two years before Alaska became a state, and Sputnik just went beep, 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 and then died. And so weather satellite generation began in the 60s, and boy, has it changed. I, if you count my time going to school and working with the weather service in the university, I've been working with satellite imagery for half of the life of the discipline. This is, I'm getting old, but also it's a young science and things are changing really quick. And now there's new satellites that are being launched that just make you so excited about the kinds of information that are being revealed uh, by the satellite um, information. Speaking of, here's a artist's rendition of the newest American polar orbiting weather satellite. On the underside there, you see a number of instruments. The weather satellite is kind of like a Christmas tree. You put a lot of ornaments on it. You've got the structure, you can hang a lot of instruments. And coming around now, we can see that um, contributing to the war on coal, this is a solar-powered uh, satellite up there. Coal-fired satellites proved to be impractical. <laughs> but the, that is our newest one. We'll be launching another one later this year that's a very similar um, instrument. To change gears, this is a sculpture by Michelangelo. It's in, uh, one of the basilicas. Sorry, I'm not a, a sculpture expert. But even I can see that this is amazing. And apparently, this is one of the stories that's out there, somebody came up to Michelangelo and said, Michael, you're amazing. These sculptures are really something. How do you do it? And the story goes, uh, Michelangelo said, well, see, they brought me this big block of marble. They just plopped it down clunk in front of me. And the statue was in there the whole time. <laughs> I just, you just had to scrape away the unnecessary bits. And if you're Michelangelo, you can say things like that. <laughs> And, and it's kind of neat, you know, for most people, if we had a block of marble like that and we started working on it, all we would have left would be the unnecessary bits <laughs> by the time we were done. But the lesson is that sometimes there's something really amazing lurking just beneath the surface, and the trick is, how do you coax it out of there? And this also applies to the weather satellite business. Here's a weather image. This is infrared part of the spectrum called the long wave infrared with a wavelength of about 11 microns. And microns takes a lot of microns to make one, for those who have hair, one human hair. And so it, it's, it's a tiny wavelength, but it's in the infrared kind of night vision goggles section, 11 micron. Well, what jumps out at this image here? You know, there's some big clouds over there. We can see the, the edge of the sea ice here in the Bering Sea. There's an anchorage barrier, the North Slope and such. But it's kind of a mess. I'm not sure what we're really looking at. Does anything jump out to you? Well, let's look at a slightly different wavelength. Same time, let's go from 11 micron to 12 micron. Believe it or not, there's a, some differences. So here's 12 micron. Well, wait, back 11, 12, 11, 12, 11, 12. Not much of a difference. Maybe, um, whoops, whoa. But guess what? There's something important down there. There's a volcano going up. This is from March of 2016. Pavlov volcano is erupting. And you wouldn't really know. It doesn't jump out in this 11 and 12 micron imagery. But what if we took the 11 and 12 and we just subtracted one from the other? How will we differ, and let's map that. And the result is this, that we can see in the red circle is the, the volcano, and the ash plume is being blown by the wind to the, to the northeast. This is important. Jet aircraft and volcanic ash don't mix 
politely, the aircraft will lose. So if you're in the weather business, your job is to protect aviators, mariners, who, whoever it is, and you have to get the warning out about where is that ash, and the way to find it is in the satellite imagery. And this methodology almost reminds me of like that Michelangelo sculpture that the information was in the 11 micron image and the 12, but you can't see it, the human being can't see it, but what if we, what if we combine or reveal the data in a way that brings to the surface something that's important? Similarly, we're seeing with new satellite imagery, with new kinds of slices of the spectral pie available, that we can combine these, these wavelengths to get some fascinating results. Here's another true color image from a fine day in April. It was about a year ago. And this is, again, what the human eye would see if you were riding on the satellite. Now, clouds are white. Snow on the ground is white. Ice on the ocean is white. So we're trying to find the polar bear in the snowstorm here. Everything's white except for the snow is melted as breakup begins, and the open ocean is very dark here. What if it was your job to brief a pilot who's a brand new pilot, just got, just got the pilot's license, and uh, he or she is visual flight rules only, or VFR, which means you can't fly in the clouds. No getting lost in the glass of milk. You know, you gotta stay out of the clouds to be able to see everything, so VFR. You have to brief that pilot, they wanna go from say the north slope down to Anchorage, not to avoid the clouds. Using this image, how do you, how do you provide guidance? It's hard to tell, where's the clouds? Where's the clear air? Where's just snow on the ground? If we mix in some longer wavelengths, lengths getting into the near part of the infrared spectrum, this becomes this, such that there's pink clouds and blue, the blue stuff represents snow on the ground, ice on the water, basically it's not clouds. So now we can know to stay out of the pink, go where the blue is. Now we've got something. Let's zoom in on that. It's a little bit hard to see here. But uh, if we zoom in on the Bering Strait area, again, here's the visible image, what the human eye would see. And here's adding in some of the longer wavelengths. So again, what if you wanted to fly from, from up in uh, Kotzebue land over to uh, down to the Bering Strait here and had to avoid the clouds? Now we, have, we know we want to maybe go this way as opposed to trying to go that way. That's important. Let's look at a real world example. A couple summers ago, there was this guy who decided to take a solo sailboat, a tiny boat, and sail the Northwest Passage in the summertime from Europe down through the Arctic Ocean, Bering Strait, and then down into the Pacific. That was the plan. His friend said, don't do it, you will die. He said, I don't fear anything. Don't nag me with your restrictions, and I'm, I'm my own free bird, and I'm gonna fly. So out he goes, and he gets stuck. Um, got stuck right about here in there, you know, a couple hundred miles north of the, the slope there. Radio for help. The Coast Guard gets this SOS call, and the, the Coast Guard goes, oh, man, this guy's really up there in the ice. Huh, how do we go get that person? The Coast Guard called the National Weather Service in Anchorage and said, can you provide some guidance? What's the least icy way up there? Because we don't want to waste time and burn fuel just bashing through a lot of hard ice. So let's find the least icy way. There's going to be some ice, but can you give us some the quickest way to get up there. The Weather Service looked at this new satellite product. This is, this is new stuff. When I was in the Weather Service a few years ago, we didn't have this kind of information, but now it is available in these last few years. Things are getting better all the time. And the Coast Guard went up there. This was the result. Remember reading about this in the papers? No, because it didn't, it didn't make the papers, because he lived. That's the way the papers work. <laughs> is, it, I mean, if it bleeds, it leads. That's, that's what I learned from a journalism class I never took, but the, the rear admiral there had kind things to say about the, the support that they got because of the new information from these weather satellites. Again, this is Alaska. What else do you have? You've got the weather satellites. I don't want to imply that they're perfect. Weather satellites are really good. Well, it's almost like we can look at that wall. We know what color the paint is, but what color is the paint on the other side of the wall? Well, it's a little tough. The satellites do have their limitations, but they are a vital piece um, uh, in solving the puzzle. Protecting lives and property, that's what it's all about. I would like to leave you today with an image that seems to connect it. Whether satellite imagery for meteorology is all about a very functional purpose, but every once in a while, almost by accident, something happens that's just fun to look at. This image is the similar kind of color scheme where snow on the ground is blue, clouds are pink, bare ground is orange. This is from January 6th of 2016, it's high noon. Now, in interior Alaska at high noon, you got more noon than you've got high. You know, the sun is about two degrees above the horizon. So, you know how it is, you're driving south at noon and it's your hood ornament, it's the sun here. 
And so we get some long shadows. You know, Anchorage is down here, Fairbanks up there, and this is the Alaska Range. And note what's going on over here. Let's, let's zoom into there. This is Denali casting a shadow over a deck of stratocumulus clouds to the north of the Alaska Ridge. You can see the ripples in the top of those pink clouds, and then all of these shadows from the, from the mountains. Denali, the, the Alaska Range, is on the order of six million years old. This weather satellite is just a few years old. Denali has seen humanity come to Alaska. It's, it's a cultural symbol. It's a common reference point for all Alaskans. Denali's always been there from, I guess, our human point of view. It takes a weather satellite about two minutes to fly over Alaska, and that satellite caught Denali, which has always been there. This has happened so many times, but we just haven't seen it from this perspective before. And there's something captivating about that. Of course, it, it's like a sundial pointing straight north, north towards Alaska, and a sundial representing time. And we have so many overlapping scales of time here, from the millions of years of geologic time to the, the time of cultural human memory and what does Denali mean as a symbol, to the time just measured in minutes and seconds of a, a weather satellite zipping, gliding in orbit over, over us. I'd like to think that despite some of the negative consequences of our changing technology, I am concerned does the wisdom of our civilization keep pace with our intelligence, our technology? Intimidating thoughts sometimes. And yet, there's great power for good in, in the building of capacity to observe the weather, to protect people, to, to protect the landscape, and, and use this information for good, and just plain for beauty. And so I guess I would, if I were back at the coffee table after church in North Dakota, I might be in the camp that really does believe we have good reason to say that it is amazing what we can do these days and I just can't wait for tomorrow to see what more is yet to come. Thank you all very much. <laughs>